Welcome to our full moon blog here at Star Cadence Media. And the full moon is occurring on June the 22nd, just a day after the solstice. My name is Sana and I'm joined by David. Hi there. Hello. Seems like there's a lot going on with, um, of course, the sun and moon are in opposite signs. And um, I see you're wanting to highlight one of my favorite fixed stars, Arcturus. So give us a overview of what we can expect today. Indeed, really excited to talk about Arcturus, but we will come to that uh, later. Uh, I guess overall themes uh, of our blog today is that um, we will touch on the cycles of time and the mysteries of seven represented by Arcturus um, and the messages, the overall sort of message of this is about a transition and crossroads. Um, humanity is, um, and we'll explain how we've arrived at that, but humanity is kind of having a midlife existential crisis marked by the Sagittarian moon, which is all about our collective and individual thinking um, that's uh, all around us. And it's rooted in academia, it's rooted in religion, science, but really um, our individual and collective thought forms have run their course. And we are, um, I'm sure people can relate to this feels like we're jutting up against a ceiling. Um, and we will talk a little bit about perhaps why that's happening in the context of this full moon. And certainly the Gemini sun on the other side is about connecting and collaborating and communicating these ideas. And we will also touch on the Neptune T-square, which is a rare astrological configuration um, but very uh, apt and important at this time, and that is about experiencing a three-way flow of energies between our head, heart, and spirit, the Neptune T-square. And overall, this is really a message about the potential to regenerate the collective ego, if you like, of the planet, of the human species. Mm. Awesome. So let's start with just the basics. Uh, right now, as you at this full moon, you use your application that you might have on your mobile phone, you will see that the sun has just moved into Gemini. And at a full moon, as I mentioned earlier, the moon is on the opposite side um, of, of the ecliptic and it is sitting in Sagittarius. So the sun in Gemini, Gemini is ruled by Mercury, and Sagittarius is ruled by Jupiter. So exciting energies, take it away. Sagittarian moon and Gemini sun. Yeah, what an um, awesome combination, as they all are actually, but let's do a little bit of a look at this. The icon um, or symbol for Sagittarius is the archer or the half man, half horse. And it symbolizes, of course, on one aspect, man reaching for the stars. And that is the, um, the idea of the arrow being pulled back and, you know, looking outward into the universe and the multiverse. So the archer um, symbolism is, uh, talks about expansion, and in this case, expansion of our minds. And the horse speaks of exploration on uh, the physical plane, actually, because, of course, horses uh, are very much earthbound creatures. And there's an interesting dichotomy there with the man reaching for the stars and the half-horse as well. 
which sort of speaks about the limits of our exploration and the limits of humanity and that in many uh, respects we no matter how much we aim for the stars and look outward we are still anchored to the earth that is physically so the Sagittarius moon represents our emotional experiences of learning therefore and mind expansion and intellectualism and this is where we at a full moon and certainly at this time we get to confront our mental constructs both on an individual level and a collective level too how far can we go with our thinking and how do we feel about academia how do we feel about science how do we feel about religion how do we feel about the role of these three large institutions in trying to tackle and deal with the deepest existential questions that humanity has issues like where are we from what are our origins and what is our role in the wider multiverse and everything that we can see, hence the looking out to the, the stars. So that's the Sagittarius, and it's about our emotional connection to all of that idea of intellectualism and expansion of our minds. And of course, on the other side, the Gemini sun is a little more mundane and really represents data and information collection that underpins how we learn, how we uh, obtain lessons, and our beliefs. That all comes from, of course, how we've learned uh, predominantly in childhood. Um, so the polarity uh, between Sagittarius on one side and Gemini on the other is put simply, Sagittarius is the big picture, and Gemini is the details. So Gemini... Uh, tends to be analytical uh, sort of energies. It's about critical thinking. It's about being rational and reasoned. Um, and the shadow side of that, of course, is being blinkered and small and what that favorite expression, paralysis by analysis. Whereas Sagittarius is more intellectual, broad-minded, big picture thinking. Therefore, indulging in that requires some experiences to underpin it. However, the shadow side of Sagittarius can also be a little bit overbearing and know-it-all. And I wrote down a wee quote. Um, I'm not sure where it's from, but I'll read it out because it's quite appropriate. In spiritual alchemy, uh, Sagittarius represents the incineration of outdated form, the burning of old, decrepit energies, a spiritual bonfire to destroy parasites and reduce negative thoughts to ashes in preparation for the phoenix to rise. Sagittarius, therefore, is a stage of renewal in the ascending path of consciousness. Wow, that's beautiful. And I think that is quite appropriate at, at this um, time of the solstice as well. Here in New Zealand, we will start to get more and more sunlight um, during the happening during the day obviously um so it is yeah i really feel that it is a time for renewal is happening right now well let's talk about the next part then so you mentioned it briefly the t square with the with neptune and pisces so pisces is is its guardian is neptune so it's still in its home sign and the t square is where the sun moon are both making a square with Neptune at its apex. Yeah, so for those of us alive today, we haven't experienced a Neptune return or Neptune coming to his home sign because he takes around 160 odd years to go through all 13 constellations. So you know, that's back in the, what, 1800s, the last time uh, Neptune was in this position. So this is quite a momentous event, just that alone. But as you mentioned before, the T-square within astrology is an interesting geometric shape because, you know, the sun and moon, we've just talked about being opposite, but if you can imagine a triangle with the sun and the moon and then at the top of that, 
is Neptune. So Neptune plays a very important role at this full moon, especially in the context of what we've just mentioned of renewal of our collective and individual thinking. And the role of Neptune here is about opening the doors of perception and the conscious exploration of our mind and our emotions and our soul and through modalities like music, dance, sound therapies and light therapies. The Piscean vibration, of course, is mystical and magical, very enchanting. This is a wonderful opportunity to tap into our ESP, our extrasensory perception, our third eye capabilities, our clear audience, our clear sentience, our clear cognizance. And the Piscean energy is where cycles converge. And we talk about Pisces in our other blogs and elsewhere as being the sign or the house of dissolution and emergence. So where something dissolves and something emerges and that very much fits in with the process of renewal and what I mentioned before about the spiritual bonfire and Sagittarius of burning away some of the old thinking, the limits of our thinking, the limits of our mental constructs which is very much Sagittarian energy. A lot of that, of course, rooted in academia, rooted in science and religion. And our worldview as humans is very much driven by um, the lessons of the past. Yet here with Neptune and Pisces, it's about looking beyond all of that and into other dimensions so that we can tap into something other than the history as it is written, right or wrong, or as we perceive it, right and wrong. So the idea of um, tapping into those extrasensory perceptions is very much uh, alive at this time. And why? Why would we do this? And why would the role of Neptune play such a significant part in this full moon? It's because we can gain knowledge and insights without any logical uh, explanation. So in other words, flashes of insight and dreams and visions can, can appear to us. And that can happen both collectively and individually, of course. And Neptune in Pisces is about interdimensional communication. This is about making uh, ourselves available and being open to soul family, our guides, and of course, source consciousness. However, like in any sign, there's always a warning and a shadow side, and the shadow side of Neptune is that we can become very dreamy and disconnected, transcendent, and, and you know, looking at ways to escape the, the, the mundane reality and be lost in delusions of grandeur. And in Neptune, the shadow also makes it difficult to discern sometimes and to interpret what's coming through to us because this is very high vibrational high frequency insights especially when you're talking about third eye and clear audience and that sort of thing so the role of gemini as as i mentioned at the beginning the very mundane role of gemini in relationship to neptune is about say writing down what we're seeing, writing down what we're imagining and reflecting on it so that we can articulate and express um, those thoughts in a way that others can connect to it. Another way is to use art you know, or drawings um, to capture our imagination as we go through the doors of perception, as we go into our mind's eye, we can use art, writing, prose, poetry, even lyrics to songs that capture those moments and capture our imagination and capture those visions so that we can pick it up later. That's very much that Gemini influence at this time. So that's very, then at this time at the full moon where this configuration is happening, that's, those are 
you know, use that day to tune in. And if you're getting any insights, messages in whatever form, whether it is a voice you hear or a feeling you get is to get your piece of paper with your pen or your crayons, if you want to draw instead, um, and jot it down to, I guess, the more we get into that practice of the mundane, then perhaps more and more of those messages will actually sink into our conscious mind rather than this fleeting, you're not paying attention to it. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. So Arcturus, Arcturus is uh, one of the fixed stars that we always um, look at. I especially like it because um, he is um, in Virgo, he's actually conjunct my natal sun. And at this full moon, the sun makes a trine to Arcturus. What is the significance of that? Arcturus has got many uh, interpretations. And, you know, there are many astrologers that will talk about Arcturus and other, and other fixed stars such as Sirius, but it's... An enjoyable subject, um, but it's also one that has a wide range of perspectives. So just bear that in mind as I share our view of Arcturus and the sun's trying to Arcturus at this full moon. Arcturus, um, when you look at the location, if you were to pull up um, images on Google or wherever uh, on a on an app, you will see that position of Arcturus is very close to the seven stars that sit in what's called the Big Dipper or the Great Bear and mythologically that's very important so that's a uh, to, to, to imagine that perhaps have a look at it um, in real uh, life but mythologically the role of Arcturus therefore is the and certainly in the Hindu, uh, uh, they've got very strong associations with the seven stars of the Big Dipper or the Great Bear. And the location of Arcturus is important here because those seven stars or seven Rishi, which mark the uh, septenary life cycle, the seven seven cycle of life, um, Arcturus is the overseer of that process and those seven sages. And this is where the idea of the great protector. He is known as the regent protector or the protector. Um, and also the energy or deity that oversees um, justice and balance. So the position of Arcturus is interesting at this um, full moon and a trine to the sun. Arcturus, of course, sitting there um, in location or the link point to the Big Dipper or the Great Bear constellation, which has seven stars. And those seven stars, as I mentioned before, in the Hindu, certainly, and there's lots of cultures talk about the seven stars, the seven Rishi. But the septenary life cycle is very interesting here as a context. The Sagittarian context that I mentioned at the beginning was that it feels like you know, the archer looking forward and and looking out into the stars and, and thinking about where as humans we can go, and yet we're constrained by the metaphor, of course, of the horse who's bound to the earth. But the seven ratio or seven stages um, in a septenary life cycle is all about each of those sages is said to be the holder of knowledge and insight that guides us through times of transition. So each of those seven cycles of life, if you think about this from an individual and a collective experience, we all go through these seven cycles. And just for um, context, I'll, say, I'll, I'll, I'll mention what they are. The first seven years is the cycle of youth. The second seven years is the cycle of authority. The third Seven years is the cycle of where we struggle and look to um, uh, configure our identity, who we are in the world. So we're we talking sort of that 21 age. The fourth cycle is the cycle of independence. 
um, typically leaving home between sort of 21 and 28. That fifth cycle is a cycle of crisis. The sixth cycle is a cycle of authenticity. And of course, the seventh cycle is a cycle of wisdom. So in the evolutionary process, these seven stars that Arcturus oversees and protects in the mythology, each of them emits waves of energy and renewal, um, waves of regeneration that, that helps us to restore, regenerate, and, and transitional process of progress, rather, through those seven cycles. So this is to do with our hearts, the regeneration of our hearts, the regeneration of our minds, and the regeneration of our spirits. In the Egyptian uh, mythology, the uh, Big Dipper, or the seven stars within this constellation, is also called the Great Bear. And the Egyptians uh, called the Great Bear the Mother of Beginnings. And this is where... Um, the mother of beginnings is relating to the idea of the birthing of a new paradigm, the bringing in of a new uh, way of being, if you like. And that very much relates back to and circles back to what we're talking about of the Sagittarian uh, worldview is kind of constrained. You know, we've got this historical context that's come out of the, the, the universities and academic circles that's come out of the scientific circles and it's also come out of the religious circles about how the way the world works. And yet this, one of these seven stars is that at some point you have to break out of that and you break out of that to become wise. So the Arcturus presence here signals a time of not only regeneration and renewal or a phase transition from one phase to the next, it's also about birthing a new paradigm. And Arcturus' role, as I mentioned before, is to protect this process, to protect these seven sages, to protect that wisdom. And therefore, he has the characteristics of both Mars, you know, as the warrior and the protector, but he also has the characteristics of Jupiter expansion. And we call that commanding characteristics of Mars and the cosmopolitan and the diverse inclusiveness of Jupiter. The spirit animals of Arcturus are the horse, interesting uh, uh, parallel there again with Sagittarius, and the wolf. Um, the icon or the symbology is a dancing man and the role of Arcturus in the astrological lexicon is to remind us that we achieve balance and justice the word justice actually means balance in the historical context, uh, but we achieve that through, uh, we can achieve that through different modalities, one of which is power, Mars, and belligerence and quarrel, and another of which is through negotiation and conciliation and collaboration. That's more of your Jupiter energy. So that's where Arcturus fits in. So he brings a very interesting dynamic to this full moon um, and it's really one of overseeing this process of transition as we move through uh, I guess what is a humanity's midlife crisis and we're looking to what's next and what that means is that we're beginning to grapple with things like um, AI we're beginning to grapple with things like robotics we're beginning to grapple with things like politics and political structures and all of these um, pillars I guess of life that have brought us to where we are today but I think if you, anyone looks across the earth right now everything is um, being restored regenerated and it's in a time of transition and Arcturus placement here sort of reminds us that there's actually a cycle and behind that there's a cycle of seven and we're in one of those cycles, and we're in the phase between one cycle and the next. What a time to be alive. Yeah. Super cool, especially, you know, that coinciding with Neptune being in its home sign. It's, um, yeah, we've spoken about that before, about how, you know, there are certain astrological placements that have, have not happened in our lifetimes we don't live long enough at the moment to experience all those beauties that are happening so how would you summarize 
everything that you've just said. And I guess um, what can people really do to, if they want to level up, what, what are some of the tools they can really use at the time of the full moon? Yeah, leveling up, that's a good description. And when, when we go back to those seven cycles, um, you know, moving, you know, this is my guess is that we're somewhere in that crisis cycle, moving to authentic expression or authenticity. I don't think humanity could be considered to be wise at this point. So that's how I've arrived. That's my own interpretation of where we are in those seven cycles would be probably somewhere between cycle five and six or maybe six, yeah, five and six, moving from kind of an independent view of the world. Um, to a um, more interdependent view mm. of the world, you know. So that's, uh, with that in mind, um, yes, it is. It's an exciting time of transition as we move from one phase to another. But of course, that causes and leads to enormous disruption um, because there are folks out there who want the past to remain just as is and the way things are to remain just as is. And there are others who want to bring in and birth a, i.e. the mother of beginnings, the great bear energy. They want to bring in a new paradigm, a new way of doing things. So with those transitions um, and the role of Neptune here, and especially with Neptune uh, in Pisces for the first time in 160 odd years, we expect um, sages to appear. Uh, through our dreams and these can come through our individual and collective dreams they can come through insights they can come through visions or even oracles people speaking truth um, there are various uh, channels through which this next vision of the future can come through to us so if you're one of those people who is has a dream has a vision has an insight or can speak the truth at a time of transition, it's time for you to step up. Arcturus reminds us of the life cycles. The manifestation of evolutionary impulse is disruption. So in between a phase from one phase to another, before there is stability, there is a deconstruction. There is a um, discombobulation, if you like. There's a kind of What's going on here, energy? So as we consciously confront, and this is happening on both an individual and a collective level, and it's to do with our ego, and our ego is our set of beliefs about how the world works. So as we consciously, the key, you talk about how to level up, it's to be conscious of this, and to release, therefore, outdated. As I mentioned right at the beginning, about the Sagittarian energy, which of course is fire, but its role in spiritual alchemy is to incinerate outdated, old, decrepit energies and thought forms that have basically become parasitical um, and they no longer serve us. And a phoenix cannot rise mm -hmm. until we have gone through that burning process, that reducing to ashes, and in the ashes emerges something new. So with that, it's about release, but it's also about regeneration. They are two sides of the coin. We cannot regenerate until we release. And the last piece of this is that we are to consider the past, consider the learnings, to, but we are to look to the future with its promise and potential. But in doing that, we also must live in the moment and be present to those progression opportunities, hence what we mentioned before about it's great to go and explore extrasensory perception. It's great to open our third eye. It's fantastic to be lost in sound therapies and um, Tibetan bowls or whatever it is. It's great to be lost in dance and art and creative expression. But in that, there are seeds of the future coming through and if you are somebody who has the ability to bring forward, if you like, from the future to the present, an idea or a vision or an insight, or you can, you've got something on your mind that you can speak out, that needs to be brought forward, not lost 
to the dreams and lost to the imagination. If we are to be moving forward, if we are to navigate this transition from one phase to the next, if we are to honour the role of Arcturus who is overseeing this, if we are to honour the great bear, the great mother of beginnings, then this is our time. And it doesn't matter whether one person hears that or a thousand. I think it's we sometimes forget the the ripple effect. You know, you would have heard of, you know, you giving your smile to a stranger on the side of the road. We have no idea how that then goes. And it's as simple with, you know, you have a dream and share it on your social media or you'll tell your best friend and that that might have just inspired that person that hears that to take the action. It was the nudge they'd been waiting for. We are yeah. such powerful beings. We we just have no idea. So thank you so much for your take on this beautiful upcoming full moon. I would love to hear from the listeners. What was your takeaway message? Um, drop us a comment. You can find us on Facebook, Telegram, Instagram. You can book a two-hour natal reading with us, um, which will be recorded for you to keep. Or if you just want to know what your natal chart is using the true position of the planetary bodies, um, have a look in the description and you'll find the links there. So thank you so much for taking the time to listen and please share far and wide. Bye-bye.